Ah. Hmm. My little brothers were 10 years younger than me. So the most I remember is I was told to babysit them once and I didn't feel like uh, you know, entertaining them. So I turned on Jurassic Park and they were literally in ca- like little rocker car seats watching Jurassic Park, like 18 months old, and were in love with dinosaurs for 10 more years. Podcast Junkies, episode 67. In case you missed last week's show, we spoke to Rem and Jonathan of the Sci Fi Movie Podcast. If you are a fan of science fiction or just a movie buff in general, you're going to really enjoy their show. Uh, They have a fantastic chemistry and there's a couple of other guests and they rotate through um, on the show and I had a a fun time talking to them last week. And uh, it's always good to know a little bit more about guests that you've just had one-off interaction with. We're actually part of the same network, Podcastica, um, which you've heard me talk about as well. So... Uh, head on over to podcastica.com as well to check out all those shows if you haven't done so already. If you're new to the show, this is the podcast where I talk to engaging, entertaining, fascinating, fun, quirky podcasters who have uh, amazing personalities, amazing shows, and I want you to understand and get to know them in a way that's hopefully if I'm doing my job correctly, different than anything you've heard before on other interviews. So it's a chance for them to kick back and relax. And over the course of about an hour or hour plus sometimes, um, open up and uh, reveal a bit more about themselves so that you can come to appreciate them and their show a bit more. And if you're enjoying what I'm doing. And if you have recommendations for folks that you you would like to hear on the show, then definitely send those over to me. So this week is obviously no different. We get to speak to Amy Schmidauer. Uh, Amy achieved her fame online through her YouTube channel, which is extremely popular. It's Savvy Sexy Social. And uh, she started personal blogging um, before then, but in 2000. And 11 launched the Savvy Sexy Social brand on YouTube and has since then just grown to become a powerhouse in um, effectively um, branding herself and uh, delivering a message about social media marketing that's pretty on point, powerful, and uh, delivered in a way that only Amy can do it. (laughs) So we met at the first podcast movement and... Unfortunately, she wasn't at the second one, so we didn't get a chance to connect there. But uh, we've had this uh, this interview scheduled for um, some time now, and I'm really happy that we were able to find some time, um, uh, albeit not with a couple of uh, technical hiccups, as is always the case. But we, we got it done, we got it recorded, and I think you'll really enjoy this conversation where she talks about um, how she started the channel, um, the success she's having with it, and and now parlaying that success into speaking gigs and um, the start of the podcast as well as an an outreach of that YouTube channel. So a really fun and uh, fascinating discussion with my friend, Amy Schmidauer. So thanks for uh, joining me on Podcast Junkies. No problem. How are you? (laughs) I'm good. I haven't seen you in person since... The first podcast movement. That's right. I was an investor in that one. <laughs> an investor? How so? Uh, the Kickstarter or whatever. Oh, we yeah, 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 yeah. That thing. Like, were you an investor? Yes, we were an investor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you've been tracking. I mean, they've been, I mean, last, you've probably heard good stuff about the last one. They, they've they blown up and the, the, the lineup's been crazy. Yeah, I definitely was reconsidering not going for the last one when I saw who was going. Yeah. I, I mean, the, a very, very impressive lineup of, spe- of speakers, obviously, um, a lot of people that we know really well, but also um, some incredible people as well that I don't know personally, but I would love to, like Aisha Tyler. I'm completely <laughs> obsessed with her. Uh, but I couldn't make it out, unfortunately. So, But I, I've been hearing great things about podcast movement, for sure. Yeah, and as always, they're they're great for me since I interview podcasters. And I've, yeah. But the quality, I just had, um, there's a podcast called uh, Strangers with Leah Tao, and it's like a storytelling podcast, and they're part of Radiotopia. 
And so extremely popular. And I attended her session. She did a workshop on storytelling. And then afterwards I approached her and she said, she, I just finished that. I actually recorded that at her house. We ended up living in the same neighborhood. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> hilarious. So that was my first in-person interview. So it's just, um, I think, you know, even just from the first one, I think the value is in the networking and in the conversations in the hallways. Absolutely. I mean, and that's true of a lot of events, but especially that one, um, because this industry is still so not necessarily new. It's definitely not new, but it's still just, there's so much opportunity still, I feel like untapped because we are seeing a lot of the same stuff happening in a lot of cases. And, but in very special cases, we're seeing the power of audio because you're really talking about this one thing. And where I specialize in video, I get kind of two opportunities. I get the visual and the audio. But when you can do something really special with audio and make people feel like they're having a moment with you, it's very cool. So I just think that the, there, we have yet to see the best, I think, for podcasting. Do you think in a way it's uh, lagging a bit behind the maturity curve of YouTube? Um, no, not necessarily, because YouTube isn't that mature. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, well, in, in internet terms, right? Yeah. I mean, it, I kind of have to say that too, because the way that I uh, teach, when you're coming into the YouTube space, I mean, we're talking about uh, the home of cat videos, right? So the bar is very low, but if you, you give it a, your your best effort, you can really stand out. Um, but at the same time, there is that context, so when you're going into the context of the platform that is YouTube, you can go in with a suit and tie and a green screen and lots of kapow editing, but it's like, okay, great. Like, what are you doing here? Like, did, were you invited to this party? Cause clearly you don't know the type of people at this party. So you're really trying to fit into that context. And then by doing that, find a different way to stand out. So, um, that's why I say it's not that mature because I think YouTube, although, you know, we see things like, uh, Vivo and movies are streaming on YouTube. But there's a lot of different things happening. The, the origins still are very strong and, um, that's a special thing. I think we, we need a place that feels like we can be invited and fit in and it not be that difficult. And that's why I, you know, I'm always telling people like, stop worrying about gear. Just use your smartphone. Your smartphone has an amazing camera on it. Just use that and just join the party and then see what you can do and grow from there. Uh, but podcasting, has that similar barrier to entry. I think there are more logistics that you have to figure out um, to start a podcast than YouTube. You can go to YouTube, start a channel and upload a video. It's that simple. Podcasting, it's not that simple. So I think that there is a little bit more um, on this end. But at the same time, um, it's just like any other, it's like really any medium at this point. We're all journalists in some way. We're all delivering our own kind of news. And so we, there's the barrier to entry is very low, and therefore the maturity doesn't have to be that high. But that's why I think there's still the best to come for all these mediums. It's interesting that you use the analogy of journalists. Is that something as you were getting started, or is, is it something that you recollect from like watching like TV early on? Is that something that 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 sort of job title resonated with you? Well, I think it's because we're all delivering our own sort of version of whatever the news is. And that news is what's applicable to you and your audience. And in the past, in terms of multimedia, we have only known that journalists and people with TV shows have the ability to come into our lives. And that's not the case anymore. I mean, I, I barely have time to watch some of my favorite TV shows from the past because I'm watching um, real people telling me real life things that I might be able to take into consideration to better myself and my business with things like Periscope, live streaming, or YouTube, edited video, or podcasting, audio that I can listen to while I'm walking the dog. I mean, we've found a level of multitasking and productivity, if you can call those two things uh, the same thing or together in a sentence, which you really can't, but on such a new level um, that that it's, it's just like we're all our own uh, we can all be journalists now, I guess. It's, it's just sort of how I think of it that way. It, it, we have the ability to enter other people's lives if we so choose with the medium of our choice. If our audience is there, we can go there and we can tell them what we think or what we think they need to know. As long as we meet them at level playing ground of what they want to know that we already know, that's when you start to come together and find a common ground and suddenly you're an influencer in their life. 
So you started in 2011, and, and when you did, did you have people that you were looking up to in this space? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been on YouTube for much longer. That was the launch of Savvy Sexy Social, yeah. the YouTube channel. But yeah, at that point, uh, I had quite a few. And it really is stereotypical YouTube inspiration. Um, when it comes to personal vlogging, I'd been doing for a couple of years up until that point. Justine Zarek, who's better known as I, Justine, uh, was a big influencer. But when it came to, okay, I really like doing that. But now I want to launch this new space where I'm going to talk to businesses and I'm going to stay at this cocktail party. That's how to be fun and interesting on YouTube. But I also want to use that to leverage the message of how to how to market yourself as a small business. So how do I make this conversation fun and not uh, a chore? or something that needs to be outsourced because it's just so terrible. And uh, my inspiration for that was really Philip DeFranco, who is uh, has a channel called Sexy Phil or something like that. And he found a way to deliver the news or things that are interesting to him that are happening around the world to a YouTube audience. So he's talking about, you know, the war in Iraq or, you know, who's running for president and what crazy thing happened or just someone being stupid in the world. And you actually listened to it because he delivered it in a way that was fitting for the context of the platform, which he's really one of the reasons why there is that context of the platform. He's been around so long. But when you can talk about something that we ordinarily might glaze over when we hear on the night, nightly news, but you hear it in a way that's more conducive for the way you learn, that's really special. So his ability to use jump cutting and deliver that information in such a bite-sized and walk away as a smarter person kind of way, that was real inspiration for me when I launched Savvy Sexy Social. So... A lot of times when folks jump into any new space and, you know, happens with podcasting and I'm sure you've seen it with YouTube is that people think they have nothing new to offer in the space. And so I'm wondering how much of that was going through your mind. And, you know, they talk, they call it the imposter syndrome or, you know, whatever name you want to give it. But, um, did that at any point, um, hold you back from starting sooner than you would have normally? It was going through my mind a lot. It didn't hold me back at all. Um, so I guess let me answer it this way. I, I had YouTube on my side. If you look at marketers on YouTube in 2011, it was like legit emoji sad face. So bad. So the cool thing about that was, okay, you've got Stelzner with like a pretty new social media examiner. Mari Smith is the Facebook queen at this point. Um, Chris Brogan. I mean, like in 2011, we're, we know a lot of those names from back then, but those were the thought leaders and they could get on YouTube and make a 10 minute video and just ramble onto a webcam quality video and, and viewers will listen to their every word because they already trust them because of whatever relationship building process has happened prior to. So for me, where I have zero online audience, not zero, I mean, I had like my personal vlogging and I'd been on Twitter and I'd done some things, but I wasn't known as a thought leader in this space. And I'm pivoting like, Hey, I'm just a fun online person to, Hey, I'm a fun online person that actually knows how to market a brand. That was a big pivot. Um, but I was able to say like, I'm going to come into this particular industry as a nobody and make a name for myself because I said so, but mostly because I'm going to know the first way to differentiate myself. And that's with YouTube because I know how to cut a video like a boss. So I'm going to cut a video about marketing. That's going to be, uh, optimized to the nines in search so that people that are trying to find this information in a visually friendly place, you might Google it and find it as well, but I'm definitely going to be on the front page of search for YouTube. And then you're going to find me, you're going to fall in love with me and you're going to want to take this journey with me for your small business. And that's really the only reason why any of those people that may have intimidated me four or five years ago, don't, they're, they're my friends now because I didn't say, how do I beat them? Mm -hmm. I wanted to say, how do I join them? And in my own way. So you talked about your ability to uh, jump, uh, edit, and uh, yeah. edit like a boss, or is it a, like a boss lady? <laughs> <laughs> I don't say boss lady yet, but I love that term. I love that people say that. Is it, it was the, the lady boss or something lady like boss, that? Yeah. Was yeah. the was the uh, the editing all self taught? Yeah, yeah. That's all. I the first love I had in video was editing. 
Um, the first video I ever made was for my high school friend who asked me to be in her wedding. So I cut a video of people that we hadn't seen in years. Of course it was like two years. Like we were like fresh out of high school. It's like, Oh my God, I haven't seen these people in forever. And I went and got clips of video, uh, from them just saying, congratulations, Stephanie. And I just took my little Canon digital camera, which I noticed was able to obtain video. It wasn't just a digital camera. By the way, I invented the selfie with this <laughs> digital camera. Nobody was calling it selfies back then. And um, I just went around and got a bunch of clips of people like for five seconds saying like, hi, Stephanie, congratulations on getting married. Like that was it. And clipped all these videos together. And I made like a music video with copywritten music, like breaking all the rules. But it was just for uh, the rehearsal dinner. And people were in tears. Like it was like crazy. And my favorite thing in the whole world is making people feel special and being able to watch it happen. Like that is like yeah. the ultimate for me. It's like seeing the look on someone's face when they feel like they're very, they're being treated very special. So I loved that. And I knew that my videos were, uh, there was my, that video in particular had a lot of emotion into it, but the fact that it was cut together and it was like it was this huge accomplishment, I was like, I want to edit more videos that make people feel like excited and special and, and that they're getting value out of it. So editing was my first love. And I just said, I would just get video clips of anything, absolutely anything. And I was not a camera ham. So I was not getting in front of the camera at all. I was just filming my stupid friends and making like stupid videos of us being stupid. And it was fun because we could just look back on that and that's it. I just learned all the editing on my own. I am not a professional editor. I'm a very poor editor to be completely honest with you in this world. However, I know how to jump cut so I can stand in front of a camera and what would ordinarily take 10 minutes to talk about, I can cut it down to two and a half. And you may think I'm talking fast, but I'm really just cutting out all the breathing. So you don't have to hear that. And that's it. And it, it's all self-taught because it's fairly, fairly straightforward. It's not, it's not hard. Anybody can do it. So it sounds like there's an aspect of your personality that, um, I don't know if it's you in terms of your friends, but you're like, are you the, the person that likes to bring people together? Are you the party organizer? It, I, yeah, I, I, I've always liked being the connector because I think, especially because I'm an introvert, people don't believe it. I am as an introvert. The best thing you can do is be the person that knows everyone. So you, when you are doing something, you don't necessarily feel like singled out. So the coolest thing that I can do is be a connector because I can just bring a bunch of people I know together and say, you should all know each other too, because you all have me in common. So let's go from there. And that's what I love. So I love organizing that kind of stuff. And I love just like making that, that happen and making these events happen and being able to say, yeah, we, we, we did this together and we were all a part of it together and then being able to reflect on that. I think, I think that's just what we all want out of life. Do you have siblings? Yes. Too many. <laughs> I have a younger sister. She's two years younger than me. She has two children and I have two younger twin brothers. They're 10 years younger than me. Okay. So, and, um, I have an older stepsister as well. So lots of children, but, um, so what, yeah. what, how does, how does, how does that dynamic affect like, or did it have any effect on like what you've become now? Um, I don't, I don't know if I know the answer to that. That's a, that's a really interesting question. I know my sister drove me insane, um, because she's two years younger than me. Yeah. And I know that I moved out promptly at the age of 18. And so, um, maybe that's indicative of something. I don't know what, but my little brothers were 10 years younger than me. So the most I remember is I was told to babysit them once and I didn't feel like, uh, you know, entertaining them. So I turned on Jurassic park and they were literally in like little rocker car seats watching Jurassic park, like 18 months old. And were in love with dinosaurs for 10 more years. So <laughs> that's all my doing. But other than that, I mean, other than holding a bottle every once in a while and playing dinosaurs with them, I, I mean, there wasn't that much um, of a connection between us because then I moved out during their sort of growing up years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think, I think it was, I think more than anything, it was weird being an introvert with so many kids around 
because I was probably just in my room reading a book all the time. I was just asking my mom the other day, I was like, Hey, whatever happened to the babysitters club series? It'd be really great if you kept all those books. Cause I just want to have, I'm not on plan to read them, but I really would love to have them. Cause yeah. I would go in my room and read an entire book and then you'd see me for dinner. And then the next day I would do the same thing. Um, so that like, that's who I was as a kid. Well, it's fascinating because obviously anyone who reads a lot of books knows the power of, uh, that they have to, to transport you to just crazy, fantastical lands that mm -hmm. get you out of your mundane everyday life. Mm -hmm. And you get so involved in the characters. I've read books where I'm thinking of something the next day and I'm like, did that happen in real life or is it something I read yeah. in the book? <laughs> yeah. Me and my, my, my sister, my mom and I always have the same phrase. Like if one of us is saying something and, and the other two have no idea what she's talking about, we'll be like, okay, you make up your childhood. Like we, we say that all the time because one of us has some memory that's like, okay, that didn't happen. You're making up your childhood. That didn't happen. <laughs> well, it's true. Especially as a younger kid, we have just a vivid imagination. And then like, yeah. we just, you know, we eat, we eat that stuff up and anything that feeds that imagination is something we just gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What other books uh, do you remember besides the, the Babysitter Club series? Um... I was super stereotypical like that. Like that was pretty much, that was this, it was, it was like those like Nancy Drew yeah. babysitters club type of books. Like that, that was like, that was the core of like me being a kid and wanting to read was like young adult chapter books, that kind of thing. Never really got into goosebumps, but that's really funny. Cause my mom's been like, my mom's a librarian in an elementary school. She, she was a teacher at the school district that I went to. She's now the librarian, which is now called a media specialist because books are kind of going out of style, but she continues to buy books. She goes to book fairs all the time. She's like, I just got back from another book fair. Oh my God, I'm spending so much money. <laughs> and it's like the whole goosebump series. And that was fun for me to look at cause they were brand new books and they looked exactly the same. Oh yeah. Whereas like babysitters club is completely different because they had to update all the clothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because all the covers are like all dated and stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I grew up with uh, Hardy Boys and Nancy. Uh, yeah, Nancy Drew, Hardy so. Boys. Yeah, and uh, the Choose Your Own Adventure series. Yeah, that's a good one too. Of course, I'm very black and white though. I have a harder time with choose your own adventure. Like, no, no, no. Just tell me what the adventure is. Can you just, I, I can't get into that. Oh, we have an, we have an alternate ending to Jurassic Park. No, no. I liked the first one. Let's just keep it that way. I am a very like for a creative, I'm pretty black and white. Like, it, so I never really like loved to choose your own adventure. I'm like, okay, well, if I choose it, well, then I got to go back and find out the other ones and figure out like, okay, now I have to have feelings about which one to go. With. <laughs> I, I like, didn't really want it. I didn't want to have to have that decision making process. You don't want to have to do extra work. You're like, it's, right. hard, it's hard enough to find the time to be reading this. Now you're going to make me right. work for it. Right. And if I wanted to read it, cause I'm just such a little reader at this point in time, it's like, no, wait, I don't just like, no, turn page, turn page, just one after the other. Don't make me go like, the, you know, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. What about audiobooks? <laughs> I love audiobooks. Audiobooks are super inspiring in our house right now. Um, I'm at my parents' house right now because I'm waiting for my apartment to finish construction. And um, my dad has a new sales manager. My dad sells cars. And they're very, very uh, encouraged, if not required, to read books. And my dad does not read books. <laughs> it's not his thing. But he's been doing the audiobook thing. But he also like doesn't do headphones. So he literally just walks around the house with an iPad that's playing a book. Uh, but it's funny because like it just gives me so much more respect. I love the audio world because of this. Because my dad, who never reads books, is listening to an entire book in five hours. Yeah. Because he was told he had to. But most of the time, like he, he enjoys the book. And he's listening to books that I like because his sales manager told him to read them. So... I love the audio world and I just I just think it's great. It's the same thing as podcasting, right? We all want to feel like we're getting more done while we're doing something else. So ultimately, we listen to podcasts because if we're walking the dog, we, we don't daydream anymore. We need something to do, even yeah. if it means it's snowing outside, I can't look at my phone, so something might as well be playing in my ears while I'm walking. Okay, good. Okay, we got lots of things going on. Are you even in the moment? Who knows? But we're trying. And that's what makes audiobooks really cool and podcasts. It's like you think you're multitasking but you're not actually the person in your ear right now is totally in charge because you think you're multitasking, but whatever else you're doing, you're paying attention to this right now. 
And you have to, depending on the podcast, of course, you have to actually pay attention. There's certain things, like if I want to concentrate, I can't listen to a podcast mm -hmm. or do some specific yeah. work on the computer because someone's talking in my ear. I can play music. I can play like classical music or something like that. I can only play music with no lyrics. With no lyrics, exactly. exactly. And that's why I, I'm obsessed with songs for this because it's like, what mood am I in? What kind of music? No lyrics go. And I'm obsessed with songs uh, because of that. I can't listen to words unless I'm intending to listen to those words. There's just, I'm coming at the world far too much with intention right now. I don't even think it's fair to the podcaster for me to do that. That's a very, uh, interesting statement. You're, you're now, that being said, I'm going to be fully immersed in your podcast and I'm going to listen at one and a half times because you probably talk slow and I can listen very fast. I listen at so, 2x, so I, I'm yeah, with you. I have not gotten to the point where I can graduate to 2x. I wish. I'm always trying to do the math. I'm like, oh, two times. Oh, man, I'm only at one and a half. Like, how long is this going to take? <laughs> which, which app are you using? iTunes Podcasts. Oh, um, like it? Overcast. Oh, I've been hearing such. I am getting some traffic with Overcast. I think I need to look at this. Is that the Tumblr company? The Tumblr? No, that's uh, Marco Arment, the guy who created Instapaper. Um, oh. he, cre he created an app. It's I've been using it for the longest time with the new iOS, uh, with the new iTunes podcast update. It's so clunky. It's so hard to navigate in there. Overcast, these, it used to be paid. Now it's free. Mm. And you can create uh, categories. So I have like a whole podcasting section. It's just podcast about podcast, obviously. Yeah. And then I have like storytelling. And so you can put them in categories. And then. Oh, that's awesome. That is really good because one thing that I have done was I realized I wasn't listening to podcasts anymore. There was a period of time like this summer where I was like, I am done with podcasts. I just, I don't need more information in my life at this point. I need to take a step back and just listen to some music and sort of actually started falling in love with music again. But what I realized when I wanted to go back to podcasts was I had too many. And when you have too many, suddenly you're like, well, wh which one do I go to? Which episode do I go back to in terms of how many I've missed? What am I going to do in this situation? And at that point, it was like, okay, it's time to cut some out. Yeah. yeah. Because you're talking about hours of like guilt that you can't listen to. It's like, you might as well erase it altogether. That's it's, sort of, it's sort of what people do with their inbox when they get too like, big, they, they do a purge. I like the idea of categorization though, because instead of cutting people out, you're saying like, oh, I'm only in the mood for this genre at this point. And then you go there and then it's sort of like, we don't like, literally, like people don't actually like choices. I don't know why we have so many choices at this point in time. When I go to websites all the time, I'm, I'm, I'll review um, my membership group. If somebody joins at the annual premium, I'll offer them a, a website review. And every time I'm going to their website, they have like 70 menu items and all the social buttons, like, great, you got people on your website, now you're sending them away. Like, why are there all these things happening here? We as human beings don't actually like having that many choices. We don't like to choose our own adventure. Tell us what the freaking adventure is supposed to be now that I'm here. So that's why I think it's so important to just kind of keep these things prioritized and limited as possible. Something as simple as how many podcasts you subscribe to, because those are also people, you know... Jim Rohn, the five people, yada, 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 the most important people in your life, who or who are you spending the most time with? Who are those podcasts that you're actually prioritizing and spending the most time with? Or who should you be? That You know, there was one comedy podcast, I'm not going to name it, it's a very, 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 very popular comedy podcast that I loved listening to, but I had to cut it out because it was just negativity all the time. It was nothing but complaining, which is what it was built on, which is fantastic. But I was like, I can't have this energy in my life right now. I just can't. So you have to prioritize. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I like how you brought it back around from the choose your own adventure earlier. Yeah, too. That was yeah. Cool. <laughs> you like that? I took like 17 tangents and put it into one concept for you just well, now. Uh, You're is, welcome. <laughs> it is the, par the is it what's called the, the paradox of choice mm. where, you know, it's sometimes um, you have a limited amount of brain power and if, and some people are, you know, morning people, so they want to, they want to focus all their brain power in the morning. And so like, for example, I have the same exact thing for breakfast every day because I don't want to think about making breakfast Yeah. and I, and I want to know, you know, what I'm going to, and that's why Obama wears the same suit every, you know, the mm -hmm. same color suit every day. He doesn't want to think about it. And, you know, I think, uh, Steve Jobs notoriously did 
his lived his life around that concept. I, I heard he even had a he never bought a car. He had a BMW, a rental BMW, and I think oh no no he never put a license plate on the on the car. That's what it was. <laughs> I think I've heard this too. <laughs> and because he said by the time he would need to uh, get it replaced, he would just lease a new car or something. Oh like my that. god, so that's, that's I mean that's hilarious. Taking it to an extreme or something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. But yeah, I mean it's there's so much good stuff out there right now and it forces everyone to elevate their game because things that used to entertain us in the past or people that we used to go to on certain topics now compared to some of the new folks that are coming in and coming and coming coming on strong we're having to have do this you know which one do i choose and mm-hmm. so everyone in the space it's it's like on notice that if if you're not competing at a level that's professional and you know people now will give you a couple of minutes with a new podcast and if it if it right. sounds like it, the audio quality is not there and it sounds like very cheap and it's the two guys in the basement cracking jokes. It's like, well, that's, I don't have time. I don't have time yeah. for that anymore. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, it, it mostly because the access to, um, quality is there. Yeah. I mean, you can very easily send a tweet out and get a voiceover for free, get some copyright free music, Go to YouTube archives. They give away copyright free music for you to put in your videos in an external editor. I mean, there's so many ways to have quality. And um, I have a $50 microphone that's not working today, unfortunately, as you and I know from the pre-show. But it, a $50 microphone that makes me sound like I'm I'm on point with whoever's interviewing me or um, when I'm interviewing, I actually sound like I know what I'm doing. Um, it's too easy. That's why laziness of quality is just like, it's not accepted anymore because it's just too easy to have high quality. People are, think that I'm standing in a studio with professional lighting and green screens for my YouTube series. No, I'm standing in front of a plain white wall, which I removed a picture from right before turning the camera on. And I'm standing in front of windows. It's natural lighting. And I boost the ISO if I have to, or whatever the case may be with my camera. And I've got a boom mic on it. And the audio isn't perfect on my videos, but it's good enough that it doesn't send people away, which is critical. And I have a lavalier when I use my smartphone for video when I travel, because I don't take my gear when I travel, because my smartphone does a heck of a job. So it's just too easy to have good quality. Yeah. I, uh, you, you recently switched to an all-white background, right? I, think you, I did. Yeah. I did. And that's also, um, I don't know if I'm staying with it, but I'm digging it right now. Um, it. I switched to it because I'm just going through transition of where my set is currently. But um, it's it's a lot more different than I thought it was going to be. Because I've been telling people for a long time, like, don't worry about the green screen. Don't worry about having the perfect background. You know, sh- be real. Like, show what's behind you. And that's why I've always had, like, my busy bookshelf. Like, that's what my office looks like. Here's where I'm going to stand. And that's also where the light comes in. So I'm going to stand there. Um. But the white background was just because there was no other option <laughs> for the time being. So now, I, but looking at it, I'm, I'm thinking like, it's incredible. People think it is the most high quality. That's a great thing. At the same time, it's not. Because if I'm coming into this space and I'm telling you, just start with what you have, I want you to feel like you can relate to me. Because relatability is what's gotten me to this point. So as much as I like the white background, I may or may not stay with it. I, I, I think I want to go back to having the bookshelf background and this is what my office looks like. And you can show your office too. Maybe just clean your desk up and remove the coffee stains and that's it. Like it's that simple. Turn the camera on because people like to see what real life looks like. That is what the state of media is today. And that's why live streaming is kicking off so crazily. People want to see real life. What does this look like? Where are you with smoke and mirrors removed? So what's it like uh, living life in the public eye? <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I consider it that. Um, well, you're, I, you're definitely I, more public than most people, right? I guess. I, I, well, I think it's because um, I, I have a face on video and literally my brand is my face and that's being a personal brand. It's, it's not 
really vanity as much as it was like, well, it's just going to be me talking to a camera. So not much else to work with here. Plus, if you're not much of a designer and you don't have a designer on staff, like it's a lot easier to have graphics if it's just like you smiling at the camera. So um, I guess, yeah, for brand awareness, that, that that's the case. Um, but it's also because I use video. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I think uh, I, I get people coming up to me at conferences uh, usually that say, oh, hey, I know you. I, I've watched your videos before. If anyone ever walks up to me and they say, oh my gosh, I saw that one video you did. That never happens. No. If that does happen, it was like, mm, are you sure you're thinking of me? Because people that find my videos and I'm not bragging, like this is just, this is just a fact. You, people that find my videos watch much more than one. It's like Pringles. You can't stop because I talk about something in such a bite-sized and quick way that before you know it, the video's over and you're like, oh, wow, I'm going to try that or I'm going to do that or oh, that's really, oh my gosh, I was wondering about that. Now that makes sense to me. And then suddenly the next video is playing. It's how my YouTube channel is set up to be. It's how my referral content is set up to be. It's how my website is set up to be. I, people are watching a minimum of 10, if not binge watching my entire channel. I get comments all the time. Amy, I found you yesterday and then suddenly I watched your entire channel. I was like, holy man, you don't do anything, do you? <laughs> but it happens. And that's just how easy the content is to consume. So yeah, I guess that's me being in the public eye because I've created content in such a consumable, consumable capacity. It just happens. It just happens. What, but what, the, I think that the responsibility there is the more important thing because YouTubers, the origin of people creating video on YouTube set, we're sitting in a bedroom introverted people rejecting them and trying to find anyone in the world who would connect with them and creating video and putting it online. That's really scary when you transmit that to real life. And that's like, okay, created these videos, suddenly have followers and comments and it's not real until you get in person. And the first VidCons, which is a conference that's focused on YouTube, there were, you know, headliners who had no idea what they signed up for and freaking out and having lines of fans who would pay to come and see them in person. And it was suddenly very real. What bothers me today is that it's kind of like smoking. You know what you're signing up for. Okay. So when you get in person with your audience, introvert or not, you know what you signed up for. So you have to respect the people who appreciate your work and give them that time of day. And that's why as much as I love my, myself, some sitting at home on the couch and watching TV and hanging out with Lucy and like doing nothing, really not even watching TV, probably working on the computer. When I am having that moment in person with people who know who I am and have watched my videos, the very least I can do is sit there and have an extroverted conversation with them. And that may be taking a lot of energy for me, but it's so worth it because there's nothing that's going to convert better in life and in business than that personal connection. So when you started YouTubing, were you looking for that connection? Yeah, I think I was. Yeah. I think I saw people online who were, first of all, not just introverted, but making a trip to Target look fun. <laughs> and I was like, what is this life? <laughs> like, how cool. And I just thought, again, the editing process is what brought it for me. It really was that. But then when my friends got bored of being filmed, it was sort of like, okay, what am I going to edit? And then it was like, all right, well, I guess I could try this. And it took a lot of practice to get used to talking to a camera. It really did. But when you really quickly realize there are people on the other end, it's, you're not talking to a camera anymore. And when you stop talking to a camera and start talking to people, it doesn't matter what the medium is. That's when you suddenly become this amazing video personality that everybody thinks you were trained to be or brought up to be, or that's not what it is. I just learned how to talk to people. And, um, yeah, it's very interesting that balance, but yeah, I guess I was looking for that before. I think I was just looking for where I belonged and I didn't know where that was. I took all the paths that I was told to take to get there and I had the job and I went to school for it and it was all fine and great, but I didn't, feel like there was that belonging there. So yeah, maybe I was using video for that. So you were a, a, political, sci a political science major? That's correct. And uh, used to work in a law firm? Mm -hmm. I started working at the law firm because I thought I was going to go to law school. 
smart decision to go work for the law firm before deciding to go to law school and quickly scrap that. But what was cool was they started the lobbying and fundraising sector while I was there as a secretary and I was promoted to work for the guy that started that sector. So it was the most amazing four years I could have possibly had in that case. I mean, there were people, no one was getting jobs out of college and I had the job. I had it. It was great. I worked for a brilliant man who taught me a lot and a brilliant woman who worked for him that taught me a lot. And, um, it was a great experience. And, you know, like looking back on it, it's like, well, Oh my God, who in the world is thinking about leaving this situation? But I did. Cause I just didn't see that as my future. No, it, it's not, it still isn't. Luckily I haven't looked back. At the time, I was thinking, it's cool. I'm going to go make an adventure of myself because I'm in my early 20s and I can do that. Plan B will be to get a job like this in the future because I have experience. But I haven't needed plan B yet. What was the Don't thought? take that out of context. <laughs> that sounds horrible. <laughs> also true. <laughs> uh, the, the listener can take from that, from that what they will. Just trying to have fun with this very serious talk. Um, why political science? I don't know. I mean, like I was just grown up to care about policy and like my mom would take me to campaign, um, stops and, you know, it was very important that I got registered to vote and all that. So I think that it was just a natural fit. Plus it felt very much like people skills was going to be the major takeaway. And it was. And I felt like, not that I needed people skills desperately, but I just thought I, I couldn't think of anything more valuable to have. And when you can raise money, that's a pretty crazy skill to have. And that takes a lot of people skills and a lot of relationship building. And that's a, that's a big talent. And I learned from a really, really talented person in that, in that industry. So yeah, I think it was just, that was what I, what had resonated with me most throughout my childhood of what I was paying attention to and what my mom talked to me about. And that's what I went with. It was sort of just like, whatever, pick a major, right? Yeah. Well, it's funny. Cause I mean, the way you've described it now, you've, you took aspects of that and it, and it, and the things that you've mentioned when you talk, when you talk about political science and when you talk about working at the law firm, there's pieces that you obviously pulled from there and that, that, resonated with you that you've now brought into what you're doing now with, oh, uh, with your absolutely. business. Oh, absolutely. I, there's no way, no way that I would be doing what I'm doing right now if I didn't have that four years, period. I could have still been video blogging. I still could have been very good at social media or whatever people are saying these days. But if I didn't have the ability, I mean, I was taking my vacation time at that job when it occurred to me that I was having a shift. I was taking vacation time to go to conferences. My first conference was Blog World 2010. And I was using any extra time I had to hustle on the side and work for clients for free or for nothing or for basically nothing. And if not for the people skills that I learned, heck, one of my clients that came along was a part of a, a campaign um, group email that I was a part of. It was like Dems for Hillary or something like that. And suddenly an email went out to the Dems for Hillary chain that was like, hey, I'm starting a travel blog and I need somebody that's good at social media. I was like, how did this end up here? Like, I feel like it's got to be for me. <laughs> like, that's so weird that thousands of people just got this. Like, it was so odd. But it was because of stuff like that that absolutely made me have the ability to do what I ha do now. Because I I, I didn't have any training of the sort. And what's funny is when I did put my notice in to leave the job, um, they were most nervous about hiring somebody to replace me who would have the ability to call people the way I did. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, you just, when we tell you to call someone, you just pick up the phone and call. I'm like, that's my job. I'm your assistant. Like what? I don't understand what you're saying the skill is here. And it was truly that the calls we were making were not easy ones. And even though I was just calling to set up an appointment, I was calling to set up probably between a 10 or a hundred thousand dollar appointment. So what's funny is I think you have to, to not just have the people skills, 
but you also have to be able to tell yourself stuff that's going to give you confidence in moments where you may not have it. And my confidence in those moments was always, well, I'm with Dave. Like I'm calling on behalf of Dave. Like Dave's very important. So you're going to answer my call. I'm going to call the governor's office and they're going to take my call every time. I'm going to call any state rep and they're going to take my call every time. It was because of who I worked for. That's what I told myself. That's what I told myself to do the job. So I got the job done. So I don't know why they considered it this big deal, but it turns out it was because that was a people skill that I somehow picked up rationalizing as much as I did, but that's how it came and that's how it was packaged and it worked because that's how I got the job done. And all of this comes down to execution. The biggest question I get is how do you get X done or how do you do this or how do you make time for this or how do you wake up at 530 or how do you blah, blah, blah. I just do it. Like I just do it. And a very close friend of mine was just talking about doing something for free or speaking for free. And he's a new speaker and he's got to speak for free and he knows it. And I told him, I said, you're going to crush it. You're going to speak for free. And you know what? The people that aren't speaking for free aren't speaking. And they don't execute the way we do. And we understand the value of doing something that may or may not be for monetary value for the long-term result. And so that's why every time someone's like, why, how do you do what you do? It's like, how do I not do it? Like if I've made the decision. So if all that's left is execution, what's in between? Good point. Yeah, what's interesting is that when you talk about making the phone calls and knowing in, in your mind that you were calling on behalf of Dave, whether in fact, there was a Dave or not, you could still adopt that same mindset. It's true. Absolutely. And, and you could say, I'm going to pretend there's an, an incredibly important Dave that I'm doing this on behalf of. And it changes your whole persona and, and your, your, your feeling and your mindset and, and how you interact and the confidence level that it gives you when you know, like, you know, something or someone has got your back or you know what you're talking about and you're absolutely sure that there's, that you're the right person to, to give the person on the other end of the line something that they need or they may, they may not even know that they need. Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, like it, that's exactly what it is the whole time. I, you can give yourself a team if you need it. Mm. That's what it is because that's all we're really looking for we're, we're looking to be supported. We're looking for people that will lift us higher. And so that's all we need is just to have the team. So what does the team have to look like for you in order for you to feel confident? If that's the barrier to entry, make a team. And what's interesting is when you adopt this mindset, you attract like-minded folks to your circle who mm -hmm. work on that same principle. And that's probably why you gravitated towards Sue Zimmerman. <laughs> yes. God love her. She's, she's amazing. Yeah. I started seeing the first pictures when you guys met and were hanging out and, I'm, and then you guys are connected like uh, that was a trip. When we, a, if he's in a pod. I mean, you meet Sue. You want to, you want to define extrovert. Sue B. Zimmerman is in the dictionary for extrovert. And um, I spoke first. She followed soon after. I don't think she was immediately. But in the afternoon, we both had some time. And she's like, hey, I've seen your videos. Let's go make a video. And I was like, all right. And we go, we make a video. We just, she's like, hey, you, Chicky over there. Like, come over here and hold the camera. I mean, it was like so what is happening? Like, you know, I'm always like, Oh, would you like to make a video? When would we do it? And what would it be about? She's like, I was like, okay, great. And then, um, the pictures, then you start taking Instagram pictures with her and it's like, okay, where do my hands go? Like, what do I, what do I do? But yeah, I think, um, Sue has taught me a lot, but yeah, it's true. Once you start to allow yourself to expand your mind a little bit more about what you're capable of and what you should feel entitled of, of yourself and your abilities and your skill set, you attract people who are, and Sue is impressed with me. She doesn't stop telling me. And it's a really great feeling because I also want her to be straight with me and she is, but she reminds me why I'm very good at what I do. And that's why we need a team. 
because we can just get into the grind for as long as we're in the vacuum that we are and forget all of those things. And the small wins are the ones that we have to just cheers yourself with a glass of wine too, because, okay, here was the small win today. Just embrace that because if you never do that, the big wins are just going to get swept under the rug with everything else. And then it's like, okay, great. On to the next thing. It should be onto the next thing. It should be bigger and greater things. But if you can never really appreciate what you're doing right, you're never going to be good at any of this. Yeah. It's, you have to, you definitely have to take time, um, to celebrate the small wins and it's, give yourself perspective because if you try to look back a week and say, what did I get done this week? That was so mind blowing as opposed to looking back six months or a year, then you're like, wow, I can't believe like a year ago I was there and and my business is here now. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, where did it go? What did I do? How did I, how did I appreciate it? And what's like, why are we doing this? Why are we lifestyle designing if we can't do that? And it's interesting to have people like uh, Sue and so for the for the listener, Sue B. Zimmerman, is, aka the Instagram expert. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so you should definitely look her up. Oh, she's fabulous. Specifically, the videos on my YouTube channel. <laughs> of course, yeah. She, we actually so talk about connecting. We have a mutual friend, Chris Cerrone, who introduced us, and Chris also introduced me to Sue. And so, mm-hmm. or, or I, I had heard Sue, and then I went to. Agents of Change two years ago, and Sue was there. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so I read, and, and I said, Sue, you know, we have a mutual friend, and that's all she needs to hear. And then she's yep. like, at lo- at the break, she's pulling me. She's like, let's go shoot a video. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's go shoot a video for Instagram, and then she's got the sign, and I'm like, wow, oh, yeah. this woman is she's a full speed ahead. Dynamo. And no doubt about it. I mean, she's come to me and she said. I saw this going on. It needs to stop. She's like, this is somebody that you should not be surrounding yourself with as quickly as she will say like, Oh, I know you through this person. Therefore you are just as good as that friend to me because I trust them and I trust their judgment. She will also come to you and say, this is bad news. You need to stop. And I think it's a motherly instinct, but she's also just, she is a true friend. That's what I would say about Sue. She is a true friend. She's a very good saleswoman and she's a true friend. But Amy, what's interesting is that when we align ourselves with um, principles or integrity or operate in a way that shows that we, we you know, respect ourselves and, and take our, uh, our clients seriously and, and our interactions seriously, I think you, you attract those types of people into your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know what? I will cheers myself to that this evening because I think I have done a decent job of that. And if you can't appreciate something like that, then I don't know what you can, because that's how I know I'm doing something right right now is because I have people like that, that are texting me, friending me on Facebook, liking my stuff, resharing it. It means I've done my due diligence and and that I continue to and that I'm trusted and that people find value in in what I'm doing. And and that's probably what I was hoping to do back in 2009 when I started the Schmatastic Vlogs. (laughs) I don't know that you would ever have imagined, or maybe you did, that you would end up at where you are now. No. I had no idea what I was signing up for back then. (laughs) And so... uh... So you obviously have your own podcast and you had um, a, a recent episode where you want, you had to decide it was a, an inflection point and, and decide what you were going to do with it because, um, you know, there's a lot of things you were going through and maybe you could touch upon that for a little bit, maybe a, a little bit about why you decided to start, uh, start it and then what happened in, in late October. Well, that's a good question because the, the purpose of the podcast never changed, which is good because that means it was exactly what it was supposed to be. Uh, the marketing lifestyle show launched in May of 2014. And I started it because people were in the audience were asking me for more videos. And I was like, screw you guys. I make three videos a week. That's a lot, but I do want to explore the audio space. So I will create a podcast for you. And so that's really where it came from. 
And so it was truly customer service for the audience. It was like, okay, you guys are really into what I'm saying. So let's have longer conversations than the two and a half to three minute videos that I usually publish. Let's have a longer format here and, and talk with other really smart people. So that's how the marketing lifestyle show started. But in terms of having systems in place and, and seeing where the ROI was on the podcast, I guess I just was unhappy with it. And I wasn't, the purpose wasn't enough for me at some point. The purpose never changed, but it wasn't enough for me. And so I thought, I just, I don't, I wasn't executing as regularly as I was supposed to be. And it just wasn't getting done because the purpose was not good enough. So I basically actually sat down with Chris Ducker while we were in England. And I was like, dude, I hate my podcast. And he's like, dude, stop doing the podcast. And I was like, all right, that's easy. (laughs) And that's, that was the plan. But when I started thinking about it, I thought, okay, the podcast is special for one reason. And it is because it's customer service for my audience. And that makes it a different point in the funnel. It's not the top of the funnel anymore. And it's certainly top of funnel for certain people. Certain people are discovering me on iTunes, but for the most part, people listening to me on the podcast have seen my videos before. So that makes it a special point in the funnel and the social funnel and the sales funnel. So with that being the case, it only made sense to transition the podcast to brand on point with my product so that I didn't have three entities floating around for one, but two, because that's truly the point where you're saying, I trust what you're saying. I've executed on things you've talked about in videos. I've gotten results. I'm now going to listen to these conversations so I can broaden my mind a little bit around some new concepts. And when you're at that point, you're absolutely ready to say, I need to join social authority membership group because that's where Amy's working in a little bit more intensive environment with businesses. It's group coaching, but it is a little bit more intensive. And so that's essentially what's happening. The marketing lifestyle show is now called the social authority podcast. The social authority podcast's purpose is to market the the membership group, but to be able to continue to have those conversations and streamline how I talk about my offering to those customers who are perfect for the group. And it's an experiment currently being measured until the end of February. If for some reason it doesn't work out, the podcast may go away. But, um, as much as I hated it before, I am really excited about it now because suddenly the purpose that it originally had and it's sort of new layer to it makes everything click. And that's when the systems get executed is when everything just clicks. Sounds like you're a big fan of systems. Yeah. I'm pretty black and white. I think I told you that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I love me some systems. (laughs) So you're back on the podcasting train. Yay. Yes. For this period of time, we'll see how it goes. I, I, I do love it though. I do love being able to sit and have conversations. And I will also say that Blab had a big part of this. Because yeah. the launch of Blab.im, ha- I hate Skype with a fiery passion. So being able to have the conversation on Blab and they so easily make it possible to download audio and upload uh, to wherever I want to put it. I just, I'm, I'm in love. I'm in love. Yeah. It, it, um, when I was listening to that episode, it seems like you're really high on Blab and Periscope. And so the whole concept of like this live streaming, you know, 2.0 or 3.0, wherever we're at. But just the fact that it's making it accessible to the masses sounds like it's really got you excited. Yeah, I love it. Um, I first of all, I, I've always loved live, but um, I've only really done live in like a live training format. So um, when it comes to like webinars and things, Periscope. Well, Meerkat became special to me because this one time I went bowling in the middle of the night with a bunch of other podcasters, and we got on Meerkat, and suddenly Shaquille O'Neal was watching my Meerkat. It was very special. And he, he dared me to bowl a strike, which I was too drunk to pay attention to, unfortunately. This is the dangers of live streaming and drinking. But I was like, this is crazy cool, like really cool. But Periscope really changed the game. When I started to see how I could use it for good and not for evil, <laughs> I can't just get on a live stream and just talk much less. Obviously made the mistake of the drunken night. But something cool came out of that where I said, if I use this, like I would use a live training format to connect with the audience in real time, but also present value. Otherwise I don't see a purpose for it. I can't just use something for the heck of it. That's what Snapchat is for. That's it. But Periscope, it has a purpose and Blab definitely has a purpose and being able to just get people on camera so easily and and quickly is, is awesome. How's your bowling? 
its uh, non-existent since that point in time, unfortunately. <laughs> but I have a feeling uh, it might happen again in San Diego at Social Media Marketing World. We'll see. Okay. So you're definitely going to be there? Yes. Speaking on video. Very cool. I think I'm, gonna yeah. fi- I'm finally going to make one now that I'm on the West Coast. And uh, it's always San Diego, right? Yep. It's, uh, it's on sale till Friday. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Note to self. Um, it is Social Media Examiner puts on an event like no one I've ever seen, whether it's online and it's as, as simple as a blab or it's offline and it is a sophisticated business event. They do it right every time. It's worth every penny and the networking is fantastic. I've heard a lot of good things about it and I think... Um, with NMX up in the air, I think yeah. I want to add another conference to the mix this year. Yeah, I, I, I stopped going to NMX a long time ago. So um, do you have a morning routine? I do. I wake up first, take a big drink of water, journal, take the dog for a walk. Unfortunately, the dog walking is my first active moment of the day. My dog is almost 12 years old and blind, so it's really not that adventurous, <laughs> but that's the routine. And then whatever the big animal project is that I'm working on, right now it's writing a book, that's the first hour of the day. I do not check email till probably 10 a.m. or really do anything socially until much later. So um, we'll wrap up here. Um, thanks for your time. You've been uh, extremely generous. No, no problem. It's been fun. We've had we've had some really enlightening conversations. <laughs> so one one uh, one last question: um, What have you changed your mind about recently? Podcast, um, and as I was working on my offering of my membership group, I changed my mind about a monthly membership because I noticed that the people that joined on an annual basis have been much more engaged and take more initiative in growing their business with the content and with the people than those who come at the entry level. So I'm actually phasing out the monthly offering or it's going to be reshaped into something else for my membership group because I've noticed that it's still not quite the right business for the group when they come in at that level. Uh, sorry, one that's more. A, that's a big one. That is a big one. Uh, one more I couldn't resist because I'm staring at it. Who's this? What's the signature on the? I have no idea. <laughs> this is my dad's man cave. So thanks for asking. So I could point that out. <laughs> um, someone that used to pay, play for Cincinnati. I don't know. <laughs> you, you are a sports fan, though, right? Ohio State Buckeyes. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Football. Okay. So uh, where can people track you down online? SavvySexySocial.com for all the videos and the podcasts for as much longer as they will be around. And my membership site is uh, SocialAuthorityMembership.com. Amy, I can't wait to hang out uh, again in person. It's long overdue and uh, sounds like it'll be in San Diego where the weather is nice. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. Can't come soon enough. Have a fantastic day. Thank you so much, Harry. Take care. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Amy. As you can see, uh, her enthusiasm, her energy just, just for me, just, uh, just bubbles up um, through the screen and, and through your headphones, I think. Um, she's just uh, nonstop energy, and uh, that's why I was really looking forward to the conversation, and she definitely didn't support, um, disappoint. So all the show notes are available at uh, podcastjunkies.com which I highly encourage you to check out because anytime there's links mentioned or something tweetable that you want to um, use to spread the word about the episode, I would love if you could do that. And uh, as always, check that out at podcastjunkies.com um, and click on the specific post for the episode. So thanks for the music it goes out to my friend Cedar and Soil. You can find more information at cedarsoil.com. Don't forget that we're always... Uh, 
letting people know about the fact that we're a member in uh, Podcastica. And podcastica.com is the place where you can find out um, more information. We're in the process of actually building the website out. Right now, it's a placeholder site where we've got the shows listed that are part of the network. And those shows include The Walking Dead cast, Evil Dead cast, Under the Comic Covers, Sci-Fi Movie Podcast, Once Upon a Podcast, Game of Microphones, and of course, our show, Podcast Junkies. If... um, you want to continue to support the show, then there's a, actually a bunch of ways you can do it, but I'll list three here. And so the, the folks that listen in on a regular basis, they understand that the most important thing you could do is subscribe to the show. It's not enough to simply download it because if you just download it, then there's a chance you're going to miss an episode. And subscribing lets you get the most recent episodes on your phone or pod or mobile device or even website because you can do that from your desktop as as they come out and that's how you demonstrate that you're a true podcast junkie podcast junkies junkie so i highly recommend um doing that and if you're new to the show then what i would suggest you do is head on over to podcastjunkies.com slash itunes and listen to five episodes I think that should do it. Five episodes that catch your eye or the most recent episodes. The last five have been pretty kick-ass, if you do ask uh, me, for my humble opinion. And it'll give you true flavor for what the show is about. So number two, if you're getting value out of it, and these are for people who have been listening for a while now, if you haven't done so already, please go ahead and uh, recommend the show to someone and uh, let them know about Podcast Junkies and encourage them to subscribe and to download the episodes if it's something that you think uh, they'll enjoy. And then last but not least, don't forget, if you haven't done so already, and I can keep track and I know who has and who hasn't, I sound like Santa Claus doing that, but head on over to uh, iTunes and leave me a rating and review podcastjunkies.com slash iTunes again to leave me the rating and to write a nice review. Um, I love to see those. Um, they're always inspiring when I do see them and, um, it really motivates me to, to keep moving. So I'm putting in as a reminder, you know, lots of uh, time into the show. I'm, I'm having a lot of, a lot of good plans for guests in 2016. Um, but there are, um, costs involved and I don't talk about this a lot. There are costs involved in getting this show to you guys every week. And so, you know, what I'd really want to do obviously is, is use, um, the support from the show to to grow it eventually uh, to a point where I, I can add more features and, and make it known to a broader audience. So short of, you know, sending um, uh, money over to versus, uh, via the Patreon page, which you can do as always, um, the, the main thing I, I just ask for now is to um, get the word out, subscribe, download, rate and review and let other people know that they can do that as well. So if you've uh, listened this far, then the you'll know that the, the retention hashtag is on the way. And for this episode, it's going to be Buckeye Amy. So it's uh, B-U-C-K-E-Y-E-A-M-Y in honor of uh, Amy being the Ohio Buckeyes uh, fan that she touched upon towards the end of the interview. So hashtag Buckeye Amy um, and then tag uh, Amy as well at, uh, at Schmittastic. Um, you, when you type in her name, you'll see that her Twitter pops up as well. So tag us both and say, hey, made it to the end of the episode. And when you do that, you know that you always have my eternal gratitude. Thanks so much, guys, for listening. Stay tuned. Next week, uh, we have a conversation with uh, my coach, Taki Moore, who is a, a master at uh, the most effective use um, and delivery of podcasts that I've um, uh had the pleasure to understand in a while. So um, we'll go into details about that next week. And so to look forward to that episode 68 with Taki Moore. Take care, guys. Have a f- take care, guys. I should enunciate a bit more, but I'm not going to record this whole thing just because I flubbed that, just so you know. Bye. Bye.